I appreciate everybody coming and you know, talk about the rare earth situation. Mark Noga actually works in the industry where you actually try to fit a rare earth magnet onto a motor that goes into a weapon system or into a medical device or into an airplane. And he'll be able to tell you what it's like actually trying to source these materials. If we could let uh, General Adams start and, and give you an overview. I'm retired uh, Brigadier General, United States Army, retired 2007, 31 years of service, exposed to the Army procurement system in the Pentagon, but also in the field, Iraq and Afghanistan. We've got to have rare earths, as you know, for almost everything electronic that we use. The dependence that we have in this case on China for rare earths is a national security threat to our country. Uh, because almost everything that we use is electronic means that almost everything that the military uses is electronic depends on rare earths. Everything from smart boxes, guidance systems for missiles, um, cockpits for, for F-35, the avionics, the things that they use to shoot and move and communicate in, in any, almost any military platform depends on rare earths. Those of you who may have a medical background uh, or just know how important potassium is for our human bodies, if you don't have a minute amount of potassium in your body, you will not live. It just means that you can't live. If you don't have a minute amount of rare earths in your smartphone, you, it, the smartphone is a rock. It's important to everybody. And we're right now, we're dependent on rare earths from China to be able to do anything that we do electronic. We recommended actions to make the U.S. less dependent on all foreign nations, nations that our interests are not the same. Obviously, there's a difference between depend, being dependent on Canada, kind of like Canada, they kind of like us, so why should we worry about things that are made in Canada? Well. Uh, I, I, I guess I don't worry about things made in Canada, but I do worry about things made in, let's, let's choose somebody at the other end of the scale. Let's imagine we were dependent on Iran. That sounds like a good idea, does it? We would not want to be dependent on Iran for really anything. We need to be able to have reliable, assured supply of the minerals, of the commodities upon which we depend for our national defense. Our lack of action to resolve the dependence on China for rare earths is itself a problem. Because the further this dependence goes on, the more our defense industrial base is undercut. China's used this time to strengthen their lock on the global rare earth market. In a national crisis, we can't depend upon foreign sources for our, our national uh, defense. Uh, I'll just give you another example that is, doesn't involve China, but it does involve a country that we all might say is a close ally, or at least not, not, not adverse to our interests. What would you say if I say that we have to be concerned about sourcing some of our national security and defense capability to Switzerland? Not a threat, right? But we were in conflict, and Switzerland decided that they wouldn't send us their advanced sites for some of our weapon systems because they didn't agree with the Iraq. I'm not gonna get into the pros and cons of the Iraq war. What I will say though is that when we're in combat, when our troops are downrange and they're getting shot at and we're trying to fight a war, that's not a good time for a country to say, sorry, but we're not gonna send you the stuff you need to fight the war. I love Switzerland, don't get me wrong. I really do. So it's not about the liking or disliking a country. We don't control those things. So the more we control in our own country, the better off we're going to be. We, the United States, have increasingly withdrawn from the mining and extracting sector for the elements that we need for our national defense. Why don't we just go mine them? There's plenty of rare earth deposits in the United States. It's not an issue. That's not the issue. The issue is how do we process it? How do we create the value chain? And the value chain currently does not exist in the United States. Let's talk about the rare earth monopoly that China has. So 20 years ago, the U.S. was largely self-reliant. We produced rare earth oxides. And we produced the rare earth magnets that are a requirement that we have to have for our defense systems. Rare earths are an essential component of advanced magnets. So 20 years ago, there was no supply chain problem. There's no value chain problem. Or it was incipient. We didn't realize, we didn't realize it yet. But since 2000, China has really cornered the market on rare earth production, along with the high-tech components that depend on rare earths. Well, it's not just the rare earths, it's all the components that go into rare earths 
that China has sucked in to their country. Not only do we lose the components that are that depend on rare earths, we also lose the intellectual property. Probably everybody in the room either has a smartphone or you've got a friend that's got a smartphone or maybe a cat that's got a smartphone. The iPhone was first made in 2007. Now, Steve Jobs did not want to make that iPhone in China. And they would do it, but they'd suck the IP. So he brought the iPhone out 2007, January, by August 2007. Huawei, those of you who have been in a room and know about Huawei, Huawei had their knockoff done by August. From their perspective, why not? It's easy. It is good for China. Not so good for us. Competitively, that hurts us. From a standpoint of losing the IP, and frankly, losing the research and development that comes with the IP. I mean, we stand on IP, not just to make things now, but to make things in the future and develop them. And China has, they're masters of sucking in the IP and then using that to build their R&D chain. It's not a new plan. It wasn't something they woke up in 2007 and, with the iPhone and said, yeah, okay, let's get a great idea. We're gonna develop uh, our iPhone knockoff. No. 20, 30 years ago, they said, okay, the tool we're going to use is we're going to get their IP and then we're going to make products in China. And that means not only that we're going to make products there, but we're going to know how to develop them and develop the engineering base, develop more. The bottom line on rare earths, China today has more than 90% of the global market in rare earths. That means that they've got a monopoly. If somebody wants to mine rare earths, China controls the price. They can drive that company out of business, and they've done it before. What countries have the other 10 percent? Japan is the only other country in the world that has a value chain, and it's not a complete value chain. And I just had uh, an email correspondence with the equivalent of the head of the Department of Energy over there. Japan relies on China for 90 percent of their base rare earth metals to make the metals, alloys, and magnets. What that means is by the time Japan's done taking care of themselves. There's not an ounce of non-Chinese rare earth metal, alloy or magnet in the rest of the world. The market is saturated with Chinese material. They essentially ship it around to a few places where they shape it, where they cut it, where they magnetize it, or they just put a sticker on it that says made in Belgium. But the truth is, Pentagon and our tech industry is 100% living off of Chinese metal. So it's a great question. The outright manipulation of the global supply chain is a strategic problem for the United States. It goes along with their hegemonic control over most of advanced manufacturing, most of technology that's made in the world, and also critical weapon component supply chains. So it's dangerous for us. They're not competing on a market-based platform. They're state-owned. So the, the major companies in China, they may say they're private, private in name only, because the people that control the corporations in China are either current or former members of the People's Liberation Army or some other Chinese state-owned uh, cooperative. No corporation is immune from China's leverage position, regardless of its size, country of origin, or product application. China's actually manipulated the market before. Uh, in 2010, there was a fishing dispute in the, what's called the Senkaku Islands in southeast of Japan. China claims it, Japan claims it. Chinese fishermen were in waters around Senkaku Islands and they had a violent encounter with the uh, Japanese Coast Guard. Japanese Coast Guard took the Chinese fishermen and brought them to Japan. And China said, give us, give us our fishermen back. Oh, by the way, we're gonna cut off your rear earth supply chain until we get them back didn't last long. The fishermen went back home, the supplies started flowing again. But what it shows is that China has the willingness to use rare earths as a weapon in economic and military encounters. And that's, a, that's something that should give us all pause. It's also alarming that just last month, a official publication of the Chinese government, one of their press organs, said, America should be careful because we have the rare earths and we might use them in this negotiation process. If you threaten something, that means that you might do it. Right now, we can get rare earths from China at a low enough price that discourages development of our own supply chain. But we know that if we don't address it, that they're gonna use it against us. They're gonna hold us hostage to their monopoly. I think we can demonstrate 
that our U.S. approach to rare earths and rare earths production has been haphazard, unfocused, and minimalist. Basically, we're burying our heads in the sand. The time to look at this problem and come up with a solution that works is right now. Not, not when we're having a conflict. Not when we know that this is a vulnerability that will be exploited against us if we don't address it. The heavy rare earth distribution of these easily recoverable resources is roughly three times what is currently coming out of China. So we've got the ability to get rare earths out of the ground. That's not enough because it's a very complicated processing issue. We need a national policy to address our dependence on foreign supply chains for rare earths. We need to have it now. We can't wait 10 years. Our Defense Logistics Agency should ensure that rare earths that are necessary for key defense products are included in their strategic material stockpile. That could serve as a, as a cross-agency stockpile, allowing us to acquire strategic materials, in this case rare earths, at low prices. The 2015 National Defense Authorization Act addresses stockpiling of strategic materials, including some rare earths, but a continuous review is essential given the volatile rare earths market. And finally, rare earths through U.S. industry supported by the federal government to collaborate to recapture a larger portion of the rare earth mining industry. A key component, our key point of that is what this panel is going to discuss a little bit later, which is to form a rare earth cooperative. And I'll let them discuss it in more detail. But certainly, we've got the ability to form a domestic rare earth value chain, and we should, we should take steps to, to do that. We just had meetings on both Capitol Hill and in the White House this past couple of days. There are many people who are looking at this proposal, and I think we've got a very good opportunity right now to move this proposal forward. A rare earth cooperative would act as a fully integrated value chain for the benefit of the United States and our economic allies. It would also be for the benefit of global technology corporations who need a reliable, secure, un uninterruptible source of rare earths for their business. We could actually redirect the flow of global capital. And that's important too, for our own economy. Your efforts directly benefit the United States of America. And I, as a citizen, want to encourage you to invest in this problem and help us address it. Ned, uh, who has spent his, most of his entire career working with USGS in dealing with these uh, critical material problems, is going to go through some slides for you. It's Friday, it's summer, Congress is out. So put that all together and it tells me that you folks are serious because you're here. I'm going to pick up where John left off, and, but I'm going to come at it from a geological point of view. Last year, I, along with my co-author Ann Bridges, wrote the book that you see here, Groundbreaking, America's New Quest for Mineral Independence. We did it because we were so passionate about this issue. It's underreported and people seem to fluff it off. And for those of you here who are supporting your congressmen, senators, especially those from mining states, listen, I, I'm not making any money off of this. This is a mission-driven book. Get this book, read it, brief up your senator or your congressman, okay? Make sure they understand your colleagues. Make sure they understand what's in the book. The premise of the book are, is really twofold. Number one, America is blessed beyond belief with mineral resources more than any other country in the world. When we explore for minerals, we find more. So when people say we have X tons of copper left, all you have to do is go explore and find more. Now you have X plus whatever. It keeps growing. We know that already happened with the oil and gas. Remember we were told get a cardigan sweater, we're running out of oil. That was all fake news, geological fake news, okay? This though, it is true. We have abundant mineral resources. The other premise of the book is, believe it or not, we are importing more minerals than any other country in the world. We import from 50 countries. That's about a fourth of the world's countries. We're importing from them here. But it is a fact that this is the only country in the industrial world that just tends to shun the mineral resources. In other words, policymakers, they don't talk about that. It's, it's almost like an embarrassment. They just downplay it to our detriment. Meanwhile, China is on a roll. They have made a stated policy of mineral dominance, 
And they tell you that, and when the Chinese tell you, you've got to listen. And finally, we have to reverse this silliness and do some environmentally sound mining. You know, today you can drill a hole, put hot water in, pump copper out. You don't even have to tear up like Bingham Canyon. You don't have to do that anymore. It's hard to get the message out there, you know. We're used to seeing in the 1960s, 70s, acid mine drainage commercials on TV. It's got into everybody's brain. It's hard to get it out of there. Worse than anything else is the fact we don't have any supply chains for what comes out of the ground. You know, if you dig up coal, you burn it, you make energy, blah, blah, blah. In the case of rare earth, when we mine it, there's no supply chain. So everything we mine has to go back to China. As General Adams said, we have plenty of rare earth in this country. There's a map. There are some of the prominent locations. There are others. They're not even all on the map. These have been identified by USGS, confirmed by the Department of Energy, and they've also been reconfirmed by state geological surveys. There's no shortage of rare earth ore bodies. There's a shortage or an inability to do something with the, with the ore when we pull it out of the ground. We have no supply chain to make stuff. Okay. China makes stuff. We can't make stuff. If you look at the qi, or the philosophy of China, earth, wind, you've heard, you've heard this before. There's even a rock group, earth, wind, and fire, and what was the other one? Soil, whatever. <laughs> In China, they have the fifth one element is metal. Metal is part of their philosophy. It is deeply rooted in their DNA, their political and philosophical DNA. And they have a stated goal, pounding the table of mineral dominance. Dominance. By 2030, they're going to dominate. And here's another little secret. If they don't have it in China to mine it, they'll find it. And it will find its way back to Beijing. Rare earths, which we used to dominate as late as the <coughs> 1980s, have now become the poster child for critical minerals. It's an example of why we're getting our well, heads handed to us. What you don't see in the media oftentimes is that China's uh, the largest producer. That doesn't mean they have the most, they're just the largest producer. But what you don't understand is they're also the largest importer from other, other parts of the world. Their middle class is exploding, and they need those things, again, to make stuff for their people. And if it keeps going on this way, there doesn't even have to be a threat to use it as a geopolitical instrument, just pure economics. They say, sorry, we need all everything we produce. You get none of it. If you look at China, they're the only complete end-to-end -end mine to market supply chain. And mind market means market means manufacturing again stuff. I keep saying this word. Think when I say stuff, think of iPhones, electronics, flat screens, military hardware. That, that is what I'm talking about. There's a war of resources. It's ongoing, especially over rare earth. And what people don't realize is it started 70 years ago. You know, in 1950, the Chinese were off and running as far as rare earth. They have five major rare earth institutes, each one equivalent to our DOE national labs. And as they're building these institutes, we got rid of our Bureau of Mines in the 80s. We're the only industrial country in the world that has no Bureau of Mines. So we try to do something and they dash. The Australians try to build a supply chain, it gets dashed, or the Indians or whoever. And China has a black market production that would just be the envy of any other country in the world. And they say, well, we're going to put a cap on these illegals. You know, we're going to cap them down. But really, they're in control of it. It's a gas pedal. It's a gas pedal. So, bottom line, we have a market failure. Okay, Some economists don't like that term. And I don't care if they like it or not. Use another term. It's just, just a semantics. The free market doesn't work because we have governments that support mining companies in other countries. It doesn't happen that way here. After looking at this for four or five years, I think the best thing is a co-op. You know, you go into Florida, each citrus grower doesn't make their own orange juice. It's a, I mean, it goes into a co-op. You ever hear of uh, Sunkiss? That's a co-op. True Value Hardware, that's a co-op. Ace Hardware, that's a co-op. You guys both probably belong to federal, uh, uh, Pentagon Federal 
savings alone. That's a co-op. All the credit unions are co-ops. There's the co-ops, co-ops everywhere. They're very successful, and they each want to attack a little market failure. They go around and they band together and they do this. So there's nothing wrong with it, and it looks like it might be the perfect solution for rare earth as a pilot program because if it works here, it could work for other minerals. And I'll tell you, rare earth is not the only Chinese monopoly. Not even close. Last month, the Chinese bought the specialty fluid drilling division of Cabot. And in so doing, they now control the market of cesium fomate, material used to inject into boreholes for high pressure wells like in the Gulf of Mexico. It is so exotic, you can't buy it, you have to rent it. So, you know, a tanker pulls up and you rent that, and when you're done with that well, you return it. For a stake of $130 million, they tied that up, and we're beholden to China and India and a few other countries, frankly, we shouldn't be doing business with. For Bayrite, any Texans here, or oil people here? Bayrite is a principal component for drilling money. So just when everybody says, oh, America's en we're energy independent, we don't have anything to worry about. Yes, we do have to worry all of a sudden, because they're backdooring our energy independence by going after minerals that we require to stay energy independent. What's next now? And I'm saying, how many more, how many times does this have to happen? By the way, there was no CFIUS involvement or approval of some of these deals. I, mean, I don't know what CFIUS is doing. There's a certain mine, Mountain Pass in California, that keeps bubbling and rising to the surface as like the solution to this problem, feasible. And no, it's not a solution at all. It's uh, in fact that didn't have a CFIUS review either, and it was bought by a company that's controlled by Chinese uh, investors. I don't understand, but here's the point: you can mine all of the rare earth in this country you want. Every gram of it has to go where? China. So I don't care, Mountain Pass, Mountain Pass. Okay, we have all of these rare earth deposits. We're blessed that it has to go there. We have no value chain, and it's a great question, but it really bothers me. So I'm done with rare earths now. Just imagine when the co-op is successful, could it be applied to other minerals? That blue tornado looking thing, we are beholden to China for about 17 different minerals, critical minerals at 100% import reliance and another 17 between 50 and 99 percent and some of those like arsenic antimony which is used to make munitions cesium bayrite we're in trouble folks 34 minerals almost between 50 and 100 percent import reliant and if you looked in the right hand column that had the, the countries in red, it was China and Russia, China, Russia, China, Russia, China, Russia. For 34 minerals that we're importing, the critical ones, two thirds to three quarters of our critical mineral imports to the United States are controlled by at least competitors, possibly adversaries. We wrote the book because we were stunned and we're trying to educate folks on how we got in and how we eventually, God willing, will get out of that problem. Yes? In these talks that General Adams mentioned about in the White House, what, what is the feeling about this in the White House as far as dealing with trade issues? You see China trade, and you read China trade. You're just starting to see now mention of minerals and the term rare earth. When you see the term rare earth, it means rare earth, but think in your mind, the canary in the coal mine or the poster child for the other 35 minerals that I just showed you. It's just starting to become a thing. And then the other day, what did we see? We saw G, uh, G, where did he go? He went to Southern China to a rare earth manufacturing place. Why did he do that? He's signaling. In fact, Deng Xiaoping, three decades ago, warned us. He got up and warned us. And see, we don't listen. Deng Xiaoping said, the Middle East has oil, China has rare earth. No one listened. They were telling the truth. That was in 1992 he gave a speech. And he was telling the Western world, don't fool with us because of this situation. And here we are 30 years later, boom, we're smack into it. Is there anybody in the US that's closer to making concentrate or metal or anything else? A mountain pass, uh, as you said, they can only make the light half of the rare earths. 
and uh, right now they're shipping most of the inventory. They're shipping them all. I, I was there That's two weeks. That's all they're doing. Correct. And so then they're going to sell concentrates, which is essentially, you know, dirt. They're going to start selling, shipping dirt to China. And um, there's another owner of the refining assets, and they're not getting along. And when they do get along, and they put those two back together again, they'll make oxides. And I'm going to tell you right now, oxides have no meaningful technology or defense application. And so those oxides will also be shipped to China. So if everything goes right for them, all they're going to do is feed the dragon. you got to quit feeding the dragon. Okay? So we've been working on Defense Production Act money. Molly Corp put a ton of money in that. Well, Molly Corp was raising money and doing their IPO. I was involved in this, and I was advising the Pentagon, and I was talking to Molly Corp, and I was talking to Neo Materials, which is essentially a front corporation for China. And I was made aware of a transaction where Molly Corp would buy Neo Materials, which is a front company for China, right. and essentially become part of that. And I exposed that to the Pentagon in 2009. They didn't listen. They never had a plan to make metals in the United States. They were going to feed Neo Materials, which was formerly Magnaplanch, a company in Indiana. Right. It was the sole domestic producer of rare earth magnets for our guided weapon systems. So, um, Molly Corp told, told a great story. And the story was uh, um, <laughs> their entire business plan consisted of three letters IPO. They got their IPO. And then they let the shareholders deal with the mess. And I don't think things are going to improve. In my slides, I'll be able to tell you, and I think you should know this, any rare earth company that opens up outside of China and produces light rare earths can be easily bankrupt by lowering the, the price on just two elements, neodymium and praseodymium. It's the only place they make money. Right. They actually lose money on 80% of their mineral production. So if you keep looking to companies like that to solve your problem, we're never going to get out of the doghouse. And we've got a solution for this, and I want to get into that. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. James Kennedy, one of the, if not the foremost expert on rare earths anywhere in the world today. And Jim has studied this issue for many years. He's been personally involved. And I love some of the concepts he's come up with. They make sense to me as a geologist, as a military man, and as you'll see our other panel. So, Jim, why don't you take it? It's great to be here with you. This isn't a new problem. The GAO actually determined, it's in GAO reports, that rare earths are a bedrock national security issue. And they also put in writing that, that China can use rare earths to interrupt our procurement for weapon systems. Well, that's a national security issue screaming at you, right? Literally, it's been over a decade. There have been probably two dozen bills offered, and no one's come close to solving this problem. And I'm going to tell you why. They all think it's a mining issue. So out of every single bill that's been offered, uh, with the exception of the Rubio bill today, they all talk about mining, and they're going to get those resources to you by lowering environmental standards, lowering you know human safety protections, uh, giving more access to federal lands, which I'm not opposed to. But so, like Ned said, you open 10 new rare earth mines, you have 10 guys that are going to produce concentrates or oxides, and they're going to ship to China. The problem has been alluded to by both of the other panelists, and that is because this is not a market problem. This is market failure. And so if you approach this problem <coughs> trying to solve it with traditional market mechanisms, you're going to fail, and you're going to fail because China worked into their monopolies a surety that they can challenge any uh, market-based approach to solving the problem. The last four premier leaders in China were directly involved in making serious commitments to, to building this industry. And two of them had massive financial commitments. Deng Xiaoping's family ended up actually owning and controlling Magnaplanch. That was a $70 million asset back in the 90s. That's mind blowing. Okay? The current man who is running the show that we're negotiating with, his family, according to Forbes, 
had over had nearly four hundred million dollars in rare earth refining and processing assets as early as 2012. What if the last two presidents of the United States were in the oil business? Okay, I mean we got close a couple times. This is a government operating at an interest level on these minute collection of resources, and they're making a tremendous difference. They have a hyper mercantile strategy. They use leverage. You heard the, the story about Steve Jobs. You heard that he had no place to go. You heard that a little company that could never cause us any trouble in the future called Huawei knocked off those phones in less than a year. Now, that same company that was leapfrogging on technology they could acquire this way is now considered by our government a national security threat for other technologies they've leapfrogged. That's the same for starter motors, for automobiles. That's the same for catalysts or uh, uh, green technologies. What happened to Siemens? They were going to build all the world's wind turbines. Well, they didn't have any neodymium or praseodymium metal. So all of the guts of those systems got built in China, and then some other things, and then some other things. And then the next thing you know, China's in that business, and they're in the advanced solar business. And they are building all the battery packs, uh, the advanced battery packs for electric vehicles. And when does it end? They have this China 2025 plan. But when I look at that, I see absolute global domination of every single industry that produces high margins and a good standard of living for human beings. The commercial consequence of this is they have aggregated the world's IP. Every company in the world that takes a product to the point where they want to roll it out commercially, well, that means they have to build a billion dollar factory. That need, means they need to go to a investment bankers and build that factory. And the investment bankers will never give them the money until they can prove that there will be no critical materials shortages. They end up in China, and China says to them, Build them here or no guarantee. Oh, and by the way, here's some nice land. Here's a hookup to the grid. And look, we got all these workers. And don't look over there because we're building your factory already while we're talking. <laughs> this is the, the, the consequence on the commercial side. On the military side, it's actually frightening. They control 100% of the advanced materials critical materials that go into our weapon systems. And they're doing this, they're cultivating a dependency relationship with all Western defense contractors. We have met with the defense contractors. They're scared. They actually know that China can control their ability to deliver products. And you know what, they're not so worried about the war. Because when the war starts, they know Uncle Sam will just throw on the cap and they'll get whatever they want. You know what they're worried about? peacetime stability of resources so their stock price doesn't take a hit. And I hate to say it like that, but it's true. The meetings we had were extremely frustrating. China literally has already launched active satellite systems and quantum computing. If you want to control weapon systems or drones or have information that's literally unhackable, that's two subatomic particles that can talk to each other, right? They can't intercept it. This is probably the most important thing that's going to change the world. China already has deployed a uh, rail gun. China has the largest hypersonic testing facility in the world. Space Force, they are talking about nuclear powered weapons systems. It's in their newspaper in English, begging us to read it. All of these systems, every one of them, requires super, super highly refined, high purity rare earth metals or post oxides and guess what we can't even produce them we want to do directed energy weapons how are we going to build them and deploy them in the field when china essentially controls our ability to do that there's a guy named michael pillsbury don't worry no big deal wrote the best book on this you'll ever see i recommend it to everyone here china has a philosophy and this philosophy is super aggressive I pulled this from the Cox report. I presented this once and people said, no way, you just made that up. No, this is the four highest ranking people in China. And they're essentially restating the policy of Deng Xiaoping, which says 
that everything about our economic endeavors is about our military endeavors. And so they call it 16 characters. And this is four guys saying the same thing four different ways. Let the civil support the military. I'm not making this up. This is in a Cox report from your Congress. In addition to their stated policies, they delivered everywhere. These guys are leading the world in basic science, IP, R&D, and this is really something you guys need to follow up on. These guys have developed or long stage development of next generation weapon systems and in some places we're not even in the game. Their program of global economic domination that's largely leveraged off of this tiny group of metals is much more ambitious and far-sighted than the U.S. Manhattan Project. They have two cities. Two cities they call rare earth cities like Gary, Indiana was a steel town. And that's what they were. They were built to do this and nothing else. 17 million people, a large number of working directly in it, just like in the Manhattan Project that had a peak population of about 130,000 people and cities, secret cities that our government built. Somebody was doing the laundry there, just like somebody's doing the laundry here. So just look at it. The commitment is 15 times larger. They literally have four national labs that only do rare earths. At the establishment of the Bauto Lab in 1985, they announced to the world that it was the largest dedicated rare earth facility in the world, and it still is. Now, where were we? Part-time, part-time in it. Ames Labs, for almost this entire period above, was doing nothing. Then recently, we panicked and we gave them $135 million to look for substitutes. Let's define substitute. Second best, or third best, or sort of close. That's the definition of a substitute. Are we gonna win, you know, running around trying to compete with China with substitutes? This is every single patent filed in the world from the very first rare earth patent every fi ever filed by the United States in 1950. Theirs are going up. Ours are falling. Ours are, we're drowning. We're underwater. We're not competing anymore. By sometime in 2021, China will have more rare earth patents than the rest of the world combined. They'll have so many patents, but they'll have ring fence every Western patent that exists. And when somebody in Hitachi or Boeing or Siemens wants to update their patent and keep it current, guess what? There's no room. They're ring fenced. China will one day be the most hardcore enforcer of IP in the future. Once they've ring fenced us and they got all the IP, who do you think is gonna go around with the WTO and start slapping people around? They are. There is a new ultra naturalistic military economic strategy. This law requires every single Chinese citizen and corporation and non-for-profit to act as a national intelligence asset. That means the nice Chinese kid who's related to somebody back home is powerful, that we put in a defense contractor or a national lab or is it a MIT, those guys are actually legally bound to spy for China. A good friend of mine's Chinese, his father was a general under Mao. He's very, very well connected. He's a US citizen. He's really committed to us, but we have incredible conversations. And he says to me, Jim, you guys have it all wrong in the United States. You pay your spies all this money to go out and do everything. We just tell everybody they're our spy and they do it better. And it's true. <laughs> I've had conversations with people from tai Taiwan and they've told me that China has <clears throat> communicated to them that they are Chinese citizens because they have, they have their Chinese descent. And these people are saying to me, Jim, they really believe that. And, and that follows us, even if I become an American citizen. As far as they're concerned, I have an obligation back to China. Now they're gonna be great citizens, they are, but that's how arrogant the system is. The way this thing is structured it is designed to collapse anybody who challenges it. And their official stated capacity, not what they produce, their official stated capacity is two times what they currently make. And their official internal estimates of black market is 150% of their actual production. 
which means these guys are closing, uh, uh, capable of churning out three times what the world needs. Now, if you're a businessman and you're honest and you're smart, you know what this does? They're saying, stay out of our sandbox. You come in our sandbox. You're not getting sand in the eye. You're going to eat sand. This is a clear message not to come into their sandbox, and their sandbox is rare earths. They produce 80% of the resource, they process close to 90% of the world's oxides, and they produce well over 95% of the metals, leaving China and Japan, and Japan is almost 90% dependent on them. That means nobody, and I mean nobody other than Japan, is getting a non-Chinese metal. We're all getting it. It doesn't matter if it comes from Belgium, Belgrade, it doesn't matter. We have a speaker here who actually works in the industry. Mark Nova is going to come up and let you guys know what it's actually like trying to fit rare earth magnets into a system for a defense application or a medical application or a prototype weapon. My name is Mark Nova. I've been in the motor industry from 1993 till present. The electric motor industry is a pretty small niche. Um, however, it's a $22.5 billion business, at least the segment that we refer to is the DC motor business. This doesn't include AC motors, it doesn't include uh, anything except for long field and permanent magnet DC motors. So looking forward, permanent magnets will be the lion's share of DC motors. Long field is kind of old technology. Uh, all that 22 and a half billion uh, chunk of worldwide sales it's Asia Pacific, US, and Europe that dominate. Magnets in these motors are where we find our earth materials, right? It used to be back in the 90s and the 80s, ceramic magnets, ferrite magnets, they were the norm. And in fact, you still see them quite a bit. If it's an analog brake motor in your car, power seats, window lift motors, things of that nature, now those are going to be super cheap ceramic magnet stuff, and they're great. However, those magnets are probably four megagauss Worsted energy products. Meanwhile, samarium cobalt magnets are 32 megagauss Worsteds. Neodymium is 48 to 52 megagauss Worsteds. So we're talking, those, those, those units don't mean anything to you, but you're talking eight to 10 plus times the energy product out of these rare earth magnets as opposed to these ferrite magnets. And what happens with that is we can make our motors much smaller, much more power dense, much lighter, and that becomes super attractive in newer applications. Um, you might not find an automotive manufacturer willing to spend that, that kind of premium for high powered motorized components, but you certainly will find aerospace and defense customers wanting to pay this kind of money. And as motor designers and motor manufacturers, we don't particularly care where we get this material, how it's happening, all the things that Jim and everyone else here is talking about. We just care that we can we can acquire it. I've already mentioned just in conversation, window lift motors, analog brake motors, power seat motors. If we look at, and, and those are the ones that don't use red earths necessarily, if we look at what we're doing right now in our business, almost every single motor that we propose to our customers looking forward uses rare earth magnets. There, there's, there's not a, if, if it goes on an airplane, if it goes in a military robot, if it goes in a defense system, it's going to use either neo or samarium magnets. So rare earths might not mean a lot to people here, or perhaps it means a ton to you because that's, that's your world and you love it. To me, all it means is how strong is the magnet? <clears throat> And I don't use ferrite magnets anymore. Personally, this year alone, I've worked on ERGM LRS, Argum, Hellfire, uh, Taurus missile, Joint Strike fighter, motors for guiding missile for, for the missile fin actuation. Um, that's GM LRS, Argum, and Hellfire, Taurus, fuel pump actuator, Joint Strike fighter, weapons eject systems, where a motor drives a canister that fills up uh, to a certain PSI and it blasts the missile off of the aircraft as opposed to pyrotechnics that used to do it. They're everywhere for us. Previously, there were workarounds. Um, it's called waivers, you guys, no waivers. Yeah. Sorry. Well, we don't care how we got our magnets as long as they were legal. 
the way to get ITAR compliant material is we would give our magnet vendors a drawing, then the magnet vendor would sanitize that drawing, they would send that drawing to China, and China would provide, let's say the magnet was, you know, looked like this, they would create a drawing that looked like this, and the magnet would come in like this, and then get to the United States, and we'd cut it off, and that, that would look like that, right? That, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but we would, we would make sure what we gave in terms of technical data stayed in the United States. Our United States supplier would then sanitize that, send it to China. China sends something back, and our supplier then puts a final grind on it, magnetizes it, puts a coating on it, something of that nature. So the IP hasn't gone to China. We've complied with the ITAR and off we go. Well, now with House Resolution 5515 that went into place in August of 2018, I think, it's all kind of blown up. And it, the supply base here is pretty discombobulated about it. They're not really sure uh, how to comply. We're not sure how to comply. Our competition, their legal teams comply in a manner that may hurt them, it may hurt us. We're not really sure. Our prices have gone up seven to 15 times on any Samarium, and especially Neo, because Neo. I do believe there's only one person right now that's claiming they can provide McCain Act compliant in their material. So we don't really know if it's compliant. We get certificates of conformance from our, our magnet suppliers that say that it's compliant. So that's our defense. But without either a waiver from the Secretary of Defense or the Cane Act compliant rare earth magnets, we are dead in the water. And those rare earth magnets that are McCain Act compliant are seven to 15 times more expensive, and it takes us longer to get them. Could there be a market to recycle materials as such? I don't think that that's a legit way for us in my business to use magnets. Okay. I think the infrastructure to actually recycle those materials, pulverize the magnets, reclaim them, reconstitute them, and use them, there's just not enough money in it, I don't think. That's just money. Yes, that's a good question, and I'll tell you this, John and I, John Kutch and I, have talked to some folks that are trying to do that, and, you, and they're serious, they really want to do it. Their problem is that they can't get virgin, high-quality material from China to blend those magnets back up to spec, they can't make spec magnets. So even the recycling, you can't get to where you need to be without China essentially giving you the magic dust. And you know, it, it, it's so wonderful that Mark could come here because a lot of folks aren't willing to actually say where the problems are because a lot of folks are the guys that are getting waivers that they know or they know the sourcing's not good, but where he's at in the industry, he feels like he can tell you, he thinks it's important to get this problem fixed. China has built in offensive and defensive mechanisms into their monopoly that can attack anybody trying to come into this space at many levels. Like I said, all they have to do is lower the price of neodymium and praseodymium, and every single light rare earth company in the world, outside of China, will go bankrupt. By the way, since 2010, 400 junior rare earth mining companies have gone bankrupt. This is exactly what comes out of Mount Pass. It has none of these. And when you get these, you get this little booger right here, okay? Thorium. And I'm gonna tell you a little secret about the rare earth supply chain. Historically, every single bit of rare earths in the world were a byproduct of some other commodity that was mined, and it all had this. And then when Mountain Pass opened up, they were only their only business was selling lanthanum to the petroleum industry, and they weren't even in this business. They weren't a player. Now, when they spun their IP, their IPO, they made everybody think they were these guys. They were never these guys. 
So what happens? Molly Corp comes into business. These guys still are in business, and they're supplying 100% of the world's heavy rare earths. And then something happens. In 1980, the NRC and the IAEA got together, and they wanted to solve what they considered to be proliferation issues. They wanted to control the movement of uranium or plutonium. So they went out and they got a uranium mining law and they said, let's apply this uranium mining law to every mine in the world. And when they did that, nobody could see it at the time because this is 1980. And the neodymium iron boron magnet hadn't even been invented yet. No one could see it. But in 1980, they created a law that through the regulations designed for uranium mining, put every single one of these byproduct producers out of business. They couldn't keep mining titanium and selling monazite because when they took their, their titanium out, their monazite was legally a concentrated material and monazite contains thorium. So what happens? They said, this is a liability and if we, if we do anything with this, we're gonna go out of business. So you know what they did? Open up the ground they just mined, put it back in, get a truck, dump some dirt on it. That's what they do. They spend money burying this stuff and getting it back below background radiation. And this is true for the guys that produce phosphates for fertilizer and iron ore mines. As General Adams said, if you took all of the recoverable heavy rare earths that have been pushed out of the supply chain because of this regulatory thing and that little element there, you can meet 85% of the world's rare earth demand. Literally, we could put China out of business. And what's the mining cost on this? Zero. So, when I went to the Pentagon in 2009, I wanted to propose a solution to solve it. And the solution starts with this. The solution starts with uninterruptible flow of resources. Because if you're gonna build a $5 billion metallurgical facility to make metals, alloys, magnets, garnets, and other post-oxide materials, and somebody can shut you down, you've got a $5 billion lemon, and nobody wants that much lemonade. So, job number one, uninterruptible. Job two, how do we get enough money to build a facility that can challenge two cities? Two cities, 17 million people working on this. China actually internally consumes 75% of all the world's finished rare earth products. So that means if we got every single country in the world and every corporation that needed rare earths, so we got them all to work with us to tomorrow, they'd have three quarters and we'd have to compete with them 25%. So we have to beat them with one third of scale and that's the best game we've got. How do we do that? Well, we solve it like we've solved every single market failure in this country for the last 230 years. That's by creating a cooperative, right? an old farmer co-op. First farmer, farmer co-op was created by Congress. Congress creates and authorizes every co-op that operates and continues to operate in the United States, including your, your uh, credit union, your rural electric. Congress is the only body that can give it an antitrust exemption. And by definition, if you have a legal cooperative, anybody who needs these materials can invest, even if they're competitors. Got all these resources that are being thrown away, and maybe we want to make some rare earths from coal, and we want to do some recycling. And Mountain Pass wants to keep mining their old fashioned way, that's fine. But we need an uninterruptible flow, which means we've got a thorium problem we have to deal with. So we offer a multinational platform inviting every single one of our economic allies and our NATO allies to fund this thing. And because it's a cooperative, they own it, they manage it, they run it. There's no government involvement. There's no subsidies. These guys own the off-tank in proportion to their investment. That means if Toshiba put in 10% of the money, Toshiba gets 10% of the output. Anything left over gets sold at market prices to the rest of the world. 
and then you're complying with WTO standards. This thing was vetted by the Justice Department. There's no conflict anywhere for this to happen. Who are the guys that put in the money? The great big tech companies that are pregnant with IP that they can't exploit. Because they saw what happened here, they saw what happened with Jeep, they saw what happened with Siemens. Do they really want to get in bed with China again and give them their technology? No, they're literally pregnant with, with, with new IP. And the only way they can exploit it is we can create for them an environment where it's safe. Think about this, the United States and the world, the only other guaranteed source of uninterruptible, low cost, high tech metals. We get them to come here with their next stage of IP where it's safe. We create the haven, we get their manufacturing. We get them to come here and revitalize our cities. This is a very powerful thing. And we've talked to people at JogMec. We've talked to people at Coors. I've had extensive relationships with the, the heads, the last two heads of the European Union's Rare Earth Commission. They need a solution. We can provide the solution. And the solution will put the United States back on the center of the board again. And if we're back on the center of the board again, and people are doing things in here, and customers out here are doing great with their new products, and they want to do new products, maybe we'll start ramping up that IP again. This is the only way back into the game. Now, everybody should be going, oh, but Jim, what do you do with that thorium? Well, thorium comes out of the rare earths and then another privately funded and operated entity that is very interested in developing thorium takes over the responsibility. Every time I sell a kilo of neodymium, eight cents goes in here for the long-term storage of thorium. How hard is it to store thorium? It's an alpha emitter. John's gonna to talk to you more about that, but there are sovereign entities and there are sovereign wealth funds that are very, very interested in having an international platform to develop industrial products, medical products, and mostly energy from thorium. If we do this, and we're now the new center of the world for this, you're gonna have universities hooking up to this, you're gonna have uh, DOD, ARPA, DARPA, you're gonna have corporations move their research labs really close to this thing, you're gonna have your fabricators, you're gonna have people like uh, Mark, who now have a place to go, Mark's company could say, hey, we don't have enough capital to be an owner of the cooperative, but we wanna sit right out here and we wanna fabricate. That's okay. This is gonna take some initial investment on the part of the government. No, our government, unfortunately, let me tell you a sad story. <laughs> sad story. <laughs> Stop right there. The Japanese government has invested over a billion and a half dollars trying to solve the problem. The EU has a budget of $1.5 billion to solve the problem. Russia publicly announced they were gonna spend over a billion dollars to solve the problem. You know how much the United States has spent to solve this problem? Collectively, $150 million, the majority of it for looking for alternatives. Those sneaky elements we haven't found yet. This is the problem. We haven't even taken this serious. And our own GAO has classified this as a bedrock national security issue. But it doesn't require any federal funding. No federal funding, but other governments like the Japanese government have said they would put money into this. They would walk us around to their industries and tell their industries you need to be part of this. So how does that play out then with you know, your last slide you had kind of, we're gonna have this in the United States, but all the investors are coming from these other countries and you're you're talking about more than mining you're talking about building up a whole supply chain that's going to have a lot of ip how does that remain property of the united states in any way shape or form it's not property it, the owners everybody who invests in this owns it right so so where's the u.s stake in it the u.s stake in it yeah well we have a national security issue that gets solved it's located we, in the u.s yeah, is it just because we're, we're donating the land? The reason we're the best host for this is because we have a good, I mean, despite Ned's concern, we still have a pretty healthy mining economy and it is kicking off enough what is currently thrown away, recoverable rare earths that we can fuel this thing and you could never interrupt the input flow. Europe can't do that. They don't have enough mining. 
First of all, this all came about because of thorium had all these regulations. The U.S. government put all these regulations on all these other guys. Is that right? That's correct. And if thorium hadn't been if unduly just, regulated, if they just missed it, then we'd been okay. We would have. We would still have uh, metal making in the United yeah. States, and China would not. Okay, have so now what you're technology. doing is you're putting together. You can call it a co-op. I would call it a, a co-op um, across the world. Of course. We've done very big co-ops to save the integrated Some circuit. Some tech industry, yeah. We were losing the integrated circuit industry in the 80s. It was all going offshore, and we realized what a critical national security issue that was. And so Semitech, which is an absolute model for what we're trying to do, uh, was set up and it's been incredibly successful for almost 40 years. How long in between if the president signs it to a magnet coming out? Well, so to, to actually make a magnet, uh, best case, probably three years. But we would be producing concentrates uh, within six months, oxides probably within 12 months, and then we could probably pr be producing metals in the 18 to 24 month range but then when you actually get to the chemistry of the magnets, we're going to have to uh, work out some deals with people who have the IP. But three years, we could probably do it better. I mean, you know, Admiral Rickover built the nuclear reactor for a submarine in 18 months. Quite frankly, if you guys gave this thing the juice that needed, and I'm not talking about money, I'm just talking about getting behind it. And you gave us the cloud, not us, we wouldn't run it. If you gave this thing the clout to go around the world and tap our NATO partners and say, it's a national security risk for NATO. Go to our economic partners through commerce and say to Toshiba, Hitachi, and all of these other multinationals, we've got the answer and we expect you to respond. If you gave this thing the clout it needed to solve this problem, it's faster. I don't know if it's any faster that you throw money at us, but I think it's faster when the government shows it's committed to solving a problem. I'm telling you, the whole world has been sitting on the edge of their seat so long that their legs have fallen asleep. They're waiting for the United States to solve this problem. Because so, no one else can. So I want to summarize it again. Real America. So we have lots of land. We got lots of land. So we got lots of minerals out there. So we, we find the minerals and we scoop them up and then we can't use them. So this is to make it so that we can use the materials right here. So we we're completely integrated from from finding the materials to generating the, the final product. How long it, is it going to take you before you start making money? Well, this is the beauty of a cooperative. It makes money no matter what because it sells those finished products to its owners at cost. And that's a big, scary commitment for the off-takers, right? But the off-takers know that the resources coming in are very inexpensive and they're way better than what comes out of China. This thing will be built with the most advanced uh, uh, processing, metallurgical processing uh, uh, technology there is. We believe it can compete with China. Are you going to be an advisor on this? Because it sounds like you you know all the answers. Sir, there are no profits. It's a co-op. So there's no such okay, thing as okay. profits. It's, there's no retained earnings. Okay, at the, by law, at the end of the year, you have to they're distribute buy, all left they're over. Gonna buy, they're going to spend money to put together the factory. Right. That's raw money. Right. Okay, so but they get them at cost. and they Just a minute, just a minute. Let's say they, they spend a billion dollars for the factory. How long before the, the people that put up that billion dollars will get their billion dollars back in raw materials? I know they're getting it at cost. But then they have to sell it, and if they sell it at cost, then they don't have any incentive. The factory will be productive within three years. Yeah, and within three years, it's producing material. They're buying the material, and I, I would say you that that all of these companies are going to put in a relatively small amount, and they're all going to get out a large amount, which is to protect their IP. The most important thing for these companies who have real technology is protecting their IP. By the way, the governments, not our government, unfortunately, but these other governments are interested in putting in money to help lower the cost for their industries to succeed. It's not about a break-even analysis for them. They're essentially buying their own supply chain. And if they said, hey, you know, this thing looks interesting, but what if the magnets cost twice as much, right? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to own enough of the offtake that it covers 40% of my needs 
and I'll buy the balance from China. That's okay. They'll just buy the balance from China to put in current technology that's on, on the shelf. But they'll have this portion they put in to the iPhone 27, okay, and they protect it. So, so it's not about returns. It's like saying, I have to build a factory floor over there to get something from this condition to this condition. And when it goes out to the end of the line and gets bought on a shelf, I measure my profits there. That's a contributed cost. That's all it is. But that contributed cost that will be the best money they ever spend unless they essentially want to start just, you know, uh, inviting China in to their R&D facility and just giving them a free run of the place. This is about protection. Is there potentially a legal ground of our hostile foreign actors such as China and Russia from participating in sexual law? So, the, we, no, no, well, the way we wrote the language is a copy of Semtec, and the way that happens is that that the, the charter and the bylaws will be written, and they will be written. So it's clearly in the interest of U.S. and aligned partners. And I don't think you want to legally say China can't join this, but do you really think anybody who just had their lunch handed to them for the last 15 years is going to let them in? Because it's a co-op. They don't have to let everybody in. And by the way, anybody who wants in has to get through CFIUS. And I wouldn't want to put it in language, but I would encourage CFIUS to say, hey guys, <clears throat> never gonna happen. I mean, we have to be careful about how we project uh, our willingness to play fair, but at the end of the day, that's what something like CFIUS is for. I support the uh, Defense Department's Industrial Policy Office, and um, so this is clearly a big issue. It sounds like the, a, a big message from you is that purchase commitments uh, through the Defense Production Act Title III program are really nibbling on the edge of, of the problem. And while there might be some defense direct benefits, it's not the strategic solution in, in any way, shape, or form. There, I lied to everybody. There's two tools in our toolbox for market failure. One is subsidies. One is guaranteed purchases. And what that does over time is it distorts things so bad that these guys over here who are now selling $6,000 tiny little penny sized magnets to the defense department that used to cost six bucks they're selling for six thousand do you think they'd ever want this to come into existence so you go down that road you're going to create anomalies and they're going to be really bad you can never anticipate what subsidies or other things are going to do and the distortions they're going to create the second you promise somebody that they're going to now be making 300 percent on very little you know these things, right. you're going to have a political opponent that will never go away. Yeah. Um, there are There's a better solution in the near term because in the long term, the better this thing works and the more democratic it is for its owners, the more powerful this thing's going to be. Imagine if you're a tech company and you're sitting outside this and they all get it at cost and you're paying market. Imagine these guys have automatic better access to the heavy rare earths that are coming at three times the rate they come out of China, they can now develop new technology that can't wasn't commercial before. You're sitting out here, you're never going to see that material. Just imagine sitting out here knowing that these guys have an uninterruptible flow and, and you don't. You're going to want to be in. As soon as this thing gets two or three big players in it, Everyone's going to be scared to death to be out of it is if they believe it's going to be fair and liberal and democratic for the owners. If there's somebody over here making six thousand dollar magnets that should cost six bucks and causing distortions and politically lobbying to hurt this thing and blocking it from doing things it should be doing, you're just going to create an ugly animal, right? It's going to have too many heads. We'll never cut them all off. Hi, my name is Sigal Eastman from Dominic. Yes. And so. Uh, uh, I wonder, uh, do you have any idea uh, let's say, to connect your uh, new cooperative ideas with uh, other, uh, other potential areas potential producers, such as Australia, Canada, and Brazil? Because, as you may know, John Beck uh, has invested in Australia mining projects. I've had a relationship with John Beck for some okay, time, yes. and I've had a much better, a much more formal relationship with AIST. Yes and to, to, to Shish Takagi and uh, the, his predecessor. 
Uh, we spent a lot of time on this. Our goal is to create an uninterruptible flow of material. Our goal is to, we've had discussions. We have a letter from AIST saying they're interested in this. They will participate. I've had discussions with the two, uh, the two last heads of the EU's uh, Commission on Rare Earths. They're very interested in this because they're spending 99.9% .9 of their rare earth solution money on recycling and the recycling products can't meet anything at market and they tend to be under spec. They're realizing it's, it's an unsustainable path until you get virgin material. And so we can solve their problem. We can solve Japan's problem. Japan, the country could own this. Every single big tech company in Japan could own a, a percentage of it and guaranteed uninterruptible flow in perpetuity. So, and that's our goal. Our goal is we have to have a multinational platform. It's three to one. They have 75% and if every one of us works together, all we can get to is 25. But if we get to 25, and the cooperative owners agree that they should do their own R&D and they apply 5% of their funds to internal R&D, maybe we can get back on that roadmap to leading. So yes, Japan is a, a very, very important potential part partner for us. Uh, we see that we that there. So Australia has already uh, produced their own area. And so I understand that can, such as, for example, Canada and Brazil has a potential of their earth deposits. So, uh, uh, there is a possibility to make uh, the global supply chain in free, uh, free market countries. So, right. well, uh, can this, uh, can your idea be connected such with such as global uh, free trade system? Absolutely. So, so this thing will take material from anybody who is willing to sell them material that meets their needs at their price. Remember, they're going to get most of their material from stuff that's being thrown away that's really, really good. But Mountain Pass can come here and we'll buy it if they have what we want. What's incredible is in the legislation, we allow for tolling. So let's say Mountain Pass or Bear Lake or any other rare earth mine says, it's our rare earths, but we want you to make us metals and give them back to us. In the, in the, the Rubio legislation, it allows for tolling. So they would just essentially pay a small fee above the cooperative's cost, and they would get back in metal what they gave us. This thing is designed for everyone. This thing's designed to be fair, because if we're not fair, nobody's gonna play with us. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.